this is Raina Campbell, your chief dream driver, and welcome to the No Parking Podcast, where through conversations and discussions with creators like yourself, we'll find interesting approaches to help you take your dreams out of park, put them in drive, and ride towards success. If you can't justify, if you tell yourself that you can't justify paying a lawyer three to $500 to just make sure your business is on track, you should not be in business and you're not ready to be in business. <laughs> hey, Dream Drivers, welcome to episode 105 of the Dreams and Drive podcast. Today, we are going to be speaking with Art Steele, who's an intellectual property attorney, and she's also the host of the Legal Ease for Entrepreneurs podcast, which is a podcast dedicated to educating and empowering minority entrepreneurs to tackle the legal aspects of their businesses. It also features guests who share tips and strategies on how to run a successful business. Now, why is law so important? Why are we spending a whole episode talking about, you know, how to make sure you're running a legally sound business? I think as creatives and as lifestyle entrepreneurs, we don't often prioritize this aspect of entrepreneurship. And I wanted to have Art on to kind of share her personal story and as well share the things that she has learned by working in corporate America, working at a, you know, in the tax division of a huge communications company, and then branching off and starting her own company and some of the things that she has learned by doing so. So you are going to get the best of both worlds. You're going to hear her dream driving journey as well as how she was able to um, transition out of corporate America and into entrepreneurship. And then she's going to lay down the law when it comes to the law. We're going to go through some questions from our listeners. We're going to just go through some basic things that I think would really help you guys start thinking about how you can make sure that the law is not something that you are avoiding when it comes to your dream driving journey. So some of the things that we discuss in this episode include why Art felt like she had no control as a young child, what inspired her to become a lawyer, how she started her own law firm, how Oprah inspired Art to fulfill her purpose. You know, I love Oprah. Some misconceptions that people often have when it comes to working with business lawyers. We talk about how to choose the right type of lawyer top five mistakes that many creative entrepreneurs make and we talk about the best legal answer you can ever receive but before we get into today's episode i want to remind you guys that if you have not already entered our episode 104 giveaway with jen sincero where we're giving away a copy of her book you are a badass at making money please go to dreamsanddrive.com slash win to make sure to enter there now you guys are I have been asking you guys to share on social and you have been turning up. You have been showing out and I'm just so appreciative of it. If while you're listening, you really like what you're hearing, you want to just, you know, do a quick Instagram, Twitter or Facebook share, just screenshot you listening. Right. And what I love what people do is they share it on their Instagram stories and then tag dreams and drive. So remember, we are dreams and drive across the board, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And you can also use the hashtag dreams and drive when sharing as well. Wherever you're listening, whether it be iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn, Google Play, make sure that you are subscribed so that every week you get a notification when we go live and specifically if you listen to us on apple Podcasts, make sure to rate and review us those apple podcast review really do go a long way as you know apple podcast is the biggest distribution platform for for podcasts so if people are searching if people are seeing that other listeners are leaving good reviews they're going to want to check out the show as well so i hope that you guys enjoy listening to art i encourage you to listen to this with a notepad because we definitely get tactical towards the end of the show but it's going to be well appreciated there's not going to be a dream driver tip of the week just because this is more of a longer episode but nonetheless hope you enjoy but before we bring on art i just want to share her disclaimer all of the information on this podcast and on our websites including downloads are for informational and educational purposes only you're listening to this podcast or downloading any worksheets does not create an attorney client relationship with art steel or her law firm if you have any specific questions please consult an attorney authorized to practice law in your jurisdiction Hi, Art. Welcome to this episode of Dreams and Drive. I'm so excited to have you on. Hey, Reina. Thank you so much. Um, it's such an honor to be on this podcast. 
Thank you. I feel like, okay, we have to tell the story of how did we virtually meet and then we met in real life. So I know I had listened to your episode on the Kayla Matthews Side Hustle Pro. You know, I listened to it. I thought it was really good. And I, I think maybe, I don't know, like, how did how did we connect? You can you sent me a message on so, Instagram, right? Yeah. So um, after she was featured on um, iTunes, um, the feature page, the front page. Mm -hmm. She sent you a shout out in the, in her Facebook group. She said, thanks to Raina for um, helping me do this. And I think I clicked on your page and then I saw that you did dreams and drive. And then I went to the podcast and I started listening and I was like, Whoa, like I hadn't even heard of this podcast. Um, and then I just, I think I, in, I probably DM'd you on Instagram was like, Hey, like that was awesome. How, you know, like great podcast. And I think we just kind of hit it off <laughs> after that. And then I was like, um, I, and then I went to your press page. I was like, uh, you gotta come on my podcast and <laughs> talk to me really. But I'll say it's for everybody else on how to market this podcast because <laughs> you've done an amazing job, but I love your podcast. It's, um, I wait, it's one of those podcasts where. I wait. Um, I'm so excited when I see the notification. Um, and then we got to actually meet in real life at Curl Fest yeah. this past July in Brooklyn, New York, yeah. which is fun. I was like super late. I felt so bad because you were waiting. And I'm like, oh, my God, I have to find art. And then we finally did find <laughs> no, each other. Fine. And, and then I cool. wowed all you and all of your friends with my iPhone, my yes, iPhone guys, 7 Plus. <laughs> disclaimer, the iPhone 7 Plus camera is the truth, the depth effect, whatever that thing is, is the, bomb the portrait. Right now. Yes. <laughs> I was like the cool kid. Everybody <laughs> wanted to take a picture with my iPhone. Yes, we have uh, some past amazing. guests, Mackenzie Dawkins, uh, Naturally Philo, Philomena Kane. They all got pictures with, with our super duper iPhone 7. But let's get into the episode because, you know, we can sit here chatting forever. Yeah. And our, you, are a, um, you are a listener of the show. So you already know what I'm going to ask you. Tell me who was art as a child like what inspired you when you were younger maybe let's say like who was the the nine and a half art the nine and a half year old art was just living in a different world because from I would think the regular nine-year-old mm -hmm. I I was born in um, Liberia West Africa my family moved to um, California when I was like two years old and then my mom died in childbirth when I was five years old. Wow. And uh, my dad now had a an infant and two children, um, my brother, me and my older brother. And so we moved back to Liberia to live with an uncle who was, you know, way more established than my father was at the time. So um, so we moved to Liberia. This was like 1985. It was, you know, it was tough because you're living in the U.S. with or you're just living with your parents. And then like all of a sudden you're not with your parents anymore and your mom has passed away. And I remember what that felt like. I, I remember what it meant. A lot of people thought I didn't know what it meant because I was so young, but I mm -hmm. knew what it meant that somebody had died. So we're, we're in Liberia. We're just kind of going about our business. One of the generals in the Liberian army had staged a coup, basically try to overthrow the president. And my uncle, who later adopted me, um, actually, so I refer to him as my dad, um, he was an attorney and the, um, and he worked for like the party, the ruling party. And so the way this works is whenever somebody takes, um, or wants to take power, they basically kill everybody else who was in power before them. And so we woke up that morning and the next thing we know, and I don't have too many vivid memories because I just remember the things that really stick out is we remember soldiers coming to our house asking for my dad and where he was. And we had no idea that he wasn't in the house. We had no idea. I was like, this time I was like six, I think. Did you have siblings uh, or were you just by yourself? Yeah, like me and my cousins and my mom, me and my aunt, my uncle's mm -hmm. wife. Like we were all, there were like 10 of us in the house. It wasn't just like me and my, my brothers. It was just, there were a lot of us. Um, and so they came to the house looking for him with like guns and like machine guns and basically like lined us at first, like they told us all to go outside because they wanted to search the house. And like, these are like young 18 year old kids who have like weapons. And so they're like shooting guns in the air. It was like terrifying. And luckily he wasn't there. 
because if he were, they probably would have killed him. That's just to give you a little bit of context of my world mm-hmm. when I was around that age. And then probably about five years later, um, the Liberian Civil War started and we had to move to um, the U.S. Well, we had to leave Liberia. And so it's difficult to just come to the U.S., as you know, you probably know. We left and went to Ghana for a little bit because we I had another uncle there who was who was there. So we left and went there. And all of that is to say is at a certain point, at a very early age in my life, I just always felt like I had no control. Mm. I had no control of my life. I had um, people were always telling me where to go and what to do, even though I was a child. But there were these drastic changes and I had absolutely no say in it. That's part of where I got my entrepreneurial spirit from or the spirit to just um, control my own destiny. Because I remember at one point I decided that once I became an adult, I, I kind of felt like I'll take this stuff as long as I'm a kid. But the minute I become an adult, no one is ever going to tell me what to do. That's kind of where I got that I need to control my own life and my own destiny because I, I feel like as a kid that happened to me so much. And, and it wasn't necessarily like any one person's fault. It was just circumstances of life. But I think these are the things that that shape you that you don't you don't even really know is shaping you at the time. What were your dreams back then as a child? Like, you know how we all have these very innocent dreams of like, I wanted to be a ballerina when I was younger. Uh, was there this like fantasy that you had of the world or was you kind of, did you kind of have a rude awakening to the realities of, of humanity? I remember at some point wanting to be a doctor, but I don't think that was based on anything except, you know, you're African, you kind of either have to be a doctor or a lawyer. Again, I think it comes back to controlling my destiny. The one thing I knew was that I wanted to be I wanted to be rich, not because I because of material things, but because um, my mom would always just tell me, like, as a woman, you should be doing this or you should do that or you should do that. I would just always be like, you know what? I'm going to make enough money so I can hire somebody to do this for me. That's what I want to do. I want to make enough money so that someone else can do it, because these are not things that I like doing. So when you came to America, right, did Uh you like what was that? Like, what was the time frame for that? Like, when did you come here? From God. So, so we came in 1991. I was uh, 12 years old at the time. So I was in seventh grade, middle school, and it was horrible. I got made fun of because I had natural hair and I had a thick accent. It was really difficult because um, we were poor. We left everything in Liberia. Um, my parents had to start from scratch, and so, you so came my with mom, your aunt was, and your uncle. My aunt and my uncle, who who I, I call my mom and my dad. So did your yeah. dad stay in Ghana? No. So, like, my dad, like, he... I'm being nosy. I'm sorry. I'm no, <laughs> it's fine. It's completely fine. So, like, my dad stayed in the U.S. when we moved to Liberia because the idea was for him to, like, kind of get back on his feet. But he never really got... He never got back on his feet. He never came back for us. Um, and, you know, it's, it's weird because, I mean, besides all the... Tons and tons and tons of issues that go along with that. But I think part of what happened is he just never got over my mom's death. Mm. And when you're a child, you don't really understand that because you're obviously, you know, you're thinking about your own needs, which as a child, you know, you do. But I think that's part of the problem. And so my dad, like he never got over it and we never reunited with him. And so when we moved to the U.S., um, he actually moved back to Liberia. And, um, and so at that point, my, my aunt and my uncle, my dad's brother adopted me. And so whenever I refer to like my mom and dad, really, those are the people who I'm talking about. So you said you came here and it was just kind of like a rude awakening and people weren't nice to you. Like, what did you think your life would be like, you know, as you were establishing yourself, as you were getting to know the country, assimilating, I'm supposing, like, how were like those, those teenage years like for you? And then why did you end up choosing law when you went to college? So I, I was bullied a lot, but it didn't, it didn't necessarily have a bad impact on me. Um, and, and, you know, this is not to, I'm very sympathetic um, to people who are bullied because I know how tough that can be. So as far as the bullying, that didn't bother me in the sense that it, it made me feel hopeless. It was just tough to go to school. 
interestingly enough, um, it was, it was, it was funny because we would, I would just get made fun of. Like it, it really kind of became a part of life. I was just kind of like, okay, as long as they don't beat me up, I guess I'll be, I can deal with, with the words. Right. And so, um, whenever we got our, we got our report cards during like gym class, one of the girls who would bully me, she, the teacher handed me my report card and she snatched it from my hand. And, you know, they used to call me like African booty scratcher. And oh, all, my you know, gosh. The typical- <laughs> I, oh, yeah. Episode 18, Damilari <laughs> Sanoiki, he actually did a, a trailer or he made a pilot episode for a TV show called African booty scratcher. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was an act. That's an actual term. They would call me that. They just call me all this stuff. So whatever. But anyway, so this lady, this girl who would um, bully me all the time, she snatched my report card and she started reading off my grades and it was all like a a you know like straight a's and like probably a couple of b's in there and so by the time she got to the end of my report card she paused and she was like oh you're smart and even though she didn't stop making fun of me but i could tell that she respected me (laughs) from that moment on i was like oh okay i just gotta get straight a's I was like, okay, I just got to get straight A's so I don't get made fun of. And I was like, maybe they won't like me, but they'll respect me. And so I think that was how I I coped. And I did the same thing when I was in college. I was just like, okay, I'm never going to be the cool kid. So at least I'll be the smart kid. And my parents obviously reinforced that at home because they're like, you don't need no friends. You just yes, need to my like, dad you know. would be like, you didn't go to school to make friends. <laughs> I always saw education as the key. Like my mom would always say, like, you know, of all the things that we could give you, the the most important thing that we can give you is your education. And no one can ever take that away from you. Mm-hmm. And you can use that to transcend any situation that you're in. And so I took education very seriously. So why did you decide to study, um, study? Well, you, you got a bachelor of science at Virginia Commonwealth university. Did you like, what was your major? Well, that was, that was what I thought pre-law was. (laughs) (laughs) Bachelor of science? No, no. Um, criminal justice. It was a bachelor of science in criminal justice. Yeah. So I was just like, okay, this sounds like law to me because by the time I got to college, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer and the reason. Well, the reason why was because when my family was moving here, um, because my father had been, um, was um, at risk of being persecuted because of what had happened before, um, back in 1985, we were able to apply for political asylum. Um, And my parents couldn't afford to hire a lawyer. So a corporate law firm, which often um, provides pro bono legal services, provided this legal service to my parents and helped them get political asi- political asylum. And that's how we were able to come to the U.S. And I was just really impressed by that. I thought, wow, like we were in a very dire situation and um, this law firm like helped us. You know, my dad was a lawyer, but he wasn't that kind of a lawyer. You know, he was like a litigator in Liberia. And so I had never really thought about lawyers as helping people proactively, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was when I was like, OK, um, this is what I want to do. I want to I want to speak for people who don't have a voice of their own, because that's what lawyers do. At the core of being a lawyer or representing someone is really speaking for someone who can't speak for themselves for whichever reason you want to give. You know, either most of the time, you know, they're not specialized or they're not expert experts in the law. I know it sounds cliche, but it's it's a really noble why. I just wanted to one day be that for some family who who may need a pro bono attorney. I just I, I just liked I liked that. And I was like, okay, so I'll just go and do this law thing. And also it was a way for you to give back control to people, right? Because you had that early desire to always be in control of your life. And maybe it's also helping other people find that sense of control as well. It comes from my being able to give business people this the type of control that having a good business lawyer at your side can give them is the reason why I, I, I love talking about what I do, because I think a lot of people don't 
really understand what business lawyers do. So what do business lawyers do? Maybe tell us your, you know, maybe tell us the Cliff Notes version of how you ended up having your own law firm and everything that you're doing now. Straight out of law school, I went to work at a major law firm in D.C. And I was, um, a, well, I was, I was working in the tax law department of that law firm. And I started out doing like tax litigation or, or as we call it, tax controversy. And that's basically when the IRS has some issue with your tax return and they want for you to explain it. And you can explain that difference by talking directly to the IRS. And if you guys don't agree, then they will issue you what's called um, a 90 day letter, which basically says we don't agree with what you're saying. So pay X amount. And so you have to go to court to fight it. I did that, but then I I started talking to people who um, older lawyers, if you will, and just trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. And I was told, and it makes sense, that if I really wanted to move out of that role of working at a law firm, which you can't do forever for various reasons. Um, I would have to start learning more about the transactional tax law, like how to help businesses with tax law Mm -hmm. and how to help them grow, how to um, help them not, you know, enter into transactions and business dealings without paying a lot of taxes, because that's what corporations want. And going in-house, meaning working for a corporation, is like the holy grail for most trans, for most big, um, big law lawyers. So I switched to transactional and then they're like, okay, um, you need to get your LLM. They didn't say you need to, but um, when I say they, I mean like the, vo- the, the voices of reason. <laughs> and so <laughs> I went to, um, I went to Georgetown and I got my LLM in tax. What's which that? Is just, it's like a, so it's like a, a master's in law. Okay. So a JD is not really like a master's, right? It's just like a different, it's, it's because it's really three years. Most masters are probably one or, you know, like a year and a half, but it's like three years. So it's like being a master in a very specialized field of law. And so I wanted to specialize in tax law. And, um, so I went to Georgetown for an LLM, which is like, which is like a master's of law in tax. Now, um, after about three and a half years or four years, I can't remember now, four and a half, I went to work for Discovery Communications, the Discovery Channel. And, um, working there was amazing from like a substantive perspective, but it didn't fit for me, um, personality wise. And I think company culture wise also. Mm -hmm. And so after about a year at Discovery, I left and I decided to start my own law firm. Now, as far as starting my own law firm, it was something I had felt, to be honest, it was something I wanted to do straight out of law school. I actually had already gotten an offer Mm -hmm. to go and work at that law, the big law firm before I graduated from law school, because that's kind of how it works in law school. But I didn't want to do it because um, I decided that I wanted to start my own law firm. But then I'm like, you know, how am I even going to do this? I have no idea what I'm doing. So let me just go to this law firm, get paid a ridiculous amount of money, meet some great people, learn from some great attorneys. And then after two years, I'll leave and start my own law firm. That didn't happen. So I stayed at the law firm, I think, for like four years. And then and then I still didn't leave and go start my own firm. I went and um, worked at Discovery. The reason I finally decided it was the time was because I had just gotten to the point where first, like very shortly after I got to at Discovery, I wasn't happy. I don't and I can't I think it was the culture. I think it was just me realizing that. I was putting off something that I had wanted to do for a long time. And so I was thinking that I was tired of working at the big law firm, but really I was just tired of not doing what I wanted to do. So when I moved to discovery, I thought, Oh, okay, this, I'll do this for two or five, you know, five years or two years. And, but within like six months, I was just, I was, I was done because I couldn't put away the fact that I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. And it was really bothering me. How did and it make so you I feel? Like, what was that feeling like, if you could describe it? 
Well, I can, I can say that I was completely unmotivated, um, to, to go into work at discovery. Um, I felt like a coward and I know that's a strong word. Maybe it's dramatic, but I really, that was the thing that really got me. It was like, why, why are you so afraid? Like you're not someone you've been through a lot. You've made it through a lot. How can you be afraid of something you really want to do? Like, why are you being a coward? And it's like, you know, people have been through worse in their lives than you have. And they've had way less opportunity and they've done things that they want to do no matter what. Like, you have no excuse. That was going through my head like every day um, after about six months. And so I started calling around asking people like how to do this law firm thing and still, you know, afraid to pull the trigger like a lot of people are because of one, you know, you tell yourself a million reasons, a million things for why you can't do it. But what happened is um, two things. I met Oprah, sort of. She is the CEO of Own Network, and Discovery has a lot of other networks. They have TLC, Animal Planet, um, Discovery ID, you know, like all these, diff- those are what, what are networks. And so at the end of each year, because it's a public company, um, there's a board, and um, each network CEO has to come to Discovery in front of the board and give the state of the network. So all these other people come, and it's like, yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. But obviously, <laughs> when Oprah comes to give her state of her network, it's not just some other CEO. It's freaking Oprah Winfrey, right? So they did like a, um, basically like a talk show. And people got to ask her questions. And this is like in March. I left in May. This is in March. And someone asked her some question about purpose in life. And she gave an Oprah answer. And I'm just sitting there and I'm just like, damn, I need to get up out of here. Like, like, this is not my purpose. This is not why I'm here. Like, when you, I don't, I try not to explain too much what tax, the kind of tax law I did at Discovery. And just to give you a little bit of an example, it's like 400 entities, right? Like you, Dreams and Drives is an, is an entity, right? So imagine 400 of those, wow. 200, more than 200 of which were international. And so every time Discovery wanted to buy some station abroad or do anything abroad or even locally, I had to figure out which entity would buy it so that we didn't trip up some trip up some tax law and cost the company millions of dollars. Or if the business people came to us and said, we want to do X, Y, Z, and then do this and then do that. I had to figure out tax wise how it would work without costing the company millions. It's super duper complex tax work. And so I'm just like, I have this gift. I'm really smart. I'm doing this highly complex tax work. Why am I doing it for discovery? Why am I just helping this company just make more millions? It it was like, why am I using such an amazing gift for this company? You mean your personal gift or like, did you? My my educational Mm -hmm. gift of like tax work and, and how I know how to help businesses make money, save money, be better. Like, why am I using this on this company when there are like hundreds of thousands of small businesses who would never have access to this kind of um, of a person? Why am I using that on on discovery? They can hire anybody they want. Right. Mm -hmm. Small businesses can't afford to do that unless somebody brings like unless you go to them. And so I was just like, I don't, I don't want to, I saw it as a waste. Actually, I saw myself as wasting my talent on a place like discovery. Cause I looked at it like, if I leave, they can hire anybody to replace me. They have the money, but I want to use my talent to help again. Remember like being the voice for people who don't have a voice, like mm-hmm. small businesses can't afford to hire a lawyer for six, seven, $800 an hour. You know, and I just felt like it wasn't fair. Why should big corporations be the ones who always get the good people? You know, like let the small guy have like the most amazing tax lawyer working for them for an affordable price. That's why I felt like I wasn't really fulfilling my purpose. And and that's that's what Oprah Winfrey helped me. (laughs) (laughs) 
Help you got to say thank you to Oprah. When I meet her, I'm going to tell her like art. Art was inspired I know. by what you um, what you told her. So you ended up forming your own um, your all, own law. law firm, where you now specialize in helping creatives and small business owners with tax planning. Or you focus on tax planning and intellectual property, but you also do other stuff, right? Mm-hmm. I know what it's. I know the connotation or the negative connotation that that people have toward lawyers, and I think that people what is think it? that. Well, I think people think, one, lawyers are too expensive. Lawyers okay. don't really do anything. I think the biggest mi- misconception is that you only need a lawyer when you're in trouble. And that's that's what criminal lawyers do, right? I think criminal lawyers, you only need them when you're in trouble. Business lawyers help you make more money, help you grow your business. And I And I don't think that people see business lawyers that way. And for that reason, they don't engage with them. There's also the the um, the misconception that we're really expensive and we're not affordable. And I think that comes from devaluing the service that we provide, because I don't I know some people who charge the same amount of money that I charge for. um What's the word? A trademark application for a website. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even joking. Like there are people who are charging twenty five hundred dollars for a website. But people will gladly hand that over because they can they they can see the tangible value Mm -hmm. of getting their website up and running. But they don't see the value in trademarking their business because it's not something they're going to get back instantly that they can see that they can Mm -hmm. put their hand on. And so there's so for that reason, I think people just disengage. Mm -hmm. And then everybody thinks that. I can just find what I need on Google, which is not true because there's tons of misinformation out there. How does somebody go about choosing the right type of lawyer to work with based on their needs? Hmm. Hmm. Right. So um, I think ask questions. Um, I always invite my 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 clients or prospective clients to look at my background look at, um, meaning my educational background, look at, um, publications, look at my speaking engagements. And actually I shouldn't really, I guess I shouldn't say speaking engagements, but I mean like in the legal realm, like being on panels at the American Bar Association. So I would say that you should just ask the person, there's nothing wrong with saying how many trademark applications have you processed? Mm -hmm. How many times have you, how many people have you formed an entity for? How many times have you done this? I think those are like the three most important um, um, questions that you can ask a lawyer and don't be, don't be shy to ask that. So should you never work with somebody who their number might be low? (laughs) I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily know. I I wouldn't say that if they have a low number, but if, and there's not really any way you can tell if they're lying, but if they do tell you that they have a low number, ask them why. And I think just engage the same way you would engage with a web designer. Like, you know, how many times have you done this? How many clients? Can you show me some of your portfolio? Now, that's a little different for lawyers because we have um, confidentiality, attorney, client privilege issue or ethical guidelines that we have to follow. So I can't necessarily say or point someone to my client and say, I've worked for this person because it could be a violation, an ethical violation. So it's a little difficult for us to have testimonials on our website um, just because um, of um, confidentiality issues. But the more you ask, the more information you can get. But um, I would also say not to base it on the law school that the person went to. Um, The fact that they went to Yale or Harvard means absolutely nothing. Listen, I (laughs) Um, I met a lot of professional BSers at Princeton, so I can only imagine. Yeah, (laughs) so I would say don't judge it by the fact that they went to a law school that you've not heard of. I would say maybe um, look at how long they've been out of law school because (laughs) by nature, they're probably 
probably less experienced um, after being out of law school, ask for their resume also, you know, because maybe they just graduated from law school, but they've been working for an IP lawyer the entire time they were in law school. So they may know way more about IP than I have just been working on it for two years, but they graduated, you know, law school two years ago. So um, that's what I would say. I would say ask them how many times they've done what you want them to do. Ask them for their resume. There's absolutely no, nothing wrong with asking a lawyer for their resume. And it's interesting because on like at big law firms, they put all of the, the deals and stuff that a lot of the lawyers have worked on because mm-hmm. that's how you attract clients. So what would you say are maybe let's say top five things that you think a lot of mistakes, small business owners and creatives especially make when it comes to law and how they're running their businesses? Number one is not bringing in an attorney early enough. And I think what I would like for people to think when they start a business is, I need to come up with an idea and then I need to contact a lawyer. And the reason I say that is because a lot of times you don't know what you're missing. You are not speaking to someone who's more experienced. So I would say probably the number one thing that people don't do is bring in a lawyer early enough. And that could just be a $300, $400 consultation to just talk to the lawyer and say, this is what my idea is. Can you give me some guidance on which direction I should go in? And a lot of issues can be brought up. You may not solve all of them, but at least now you know what your issues are. And so if it's something that you feel is high risk, then you can say, okay, well, I want to pay you to focus on this. That's one. Number two, I think um, not protecting their, their content. I would say that a lot of people don't take care to protect their their digital content, whether that be their photographs, um, whether that's their digital content, like a blog post or epic blog post or ebooks or workbooks. There's so much information, I think, conflicting information that a lot of people think they just know what they're doing because it's already out there. Mm-hmm. So that's one. That's two. The other thing I would say is not having the financials of their business right. That's either not um, opening a bank account or commingling their funds or just not knowing how to deal with the financials of their business, not knowing what kind of deductions they can take, um, how to position their business so that they can take more deductions um, that are perfectly legal, but you just have to know about them. Learning about the accounting and the financials of running a small business would be very helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is the biggest, I, this is probably the second one, really second biggest. So I guess we're on number four now, mm-hmm. but I would say that people, um, they project or they accept someone else's situation as their own. For example, like, you know, should I, should I form an LLC? If somebody asked me that question, I have, I have no idea. Because it really depends on your situation. It depends on your state. It depends on the business you're in. It depends on your your goals for your business five years from five years down the line. Depends on if you're getting investors. Depends on if you're going into business with someone else. Um, but because someone started their business and got an LLC right away, you feel like you need to get yours. Or if they waited a year, you feel like you needed to you need to wait a year. The best answer, the best answer that you can get when it comes to a legal question that's always going to be right, always, this question will never be wrong. When someone asks you some type of legal question, the answer is it depends. (laughs) There's never one answer. (laughs) No, it can't be because, first of all, laws vary so much by state. That's one. And it varies so much based on your situation, Right. I mean, Mm -hmm. there's some there's some clients who who come to me and they're like, should I start an LLC? And I'm like, "Uh, hell yeah, you should like right now. And then there are clients who come to me and I'm like, "Eh, I mean, you could, but you don't have to. But if I were to say that on the Internet, that wouldn't be responsible because I'm not dealing with that person's specific information. Right. Or their specific situation. So that's the one thing. Stop applying what someone else did to your situation, because they did it for whatever reason they saw fit and it may not apply to your business. 
a lot of lawyers will offer a consultation for four, three to four, five hundred dollars. And um, if you can't, this is just what I will say, and people will probably hate me for this, but if you can't justify, if you tell yourself that you can't justify paying a lawyer three to five hundred dollars to just make sure your business is on track, you should not be in business and you're not ready to be in business. <laughs> That's just the bottom line. Yeah, that's a crucial investment. Like even if you need to borrow some money so you can get that stuff, yes. that's, that's, an, that's an investment that I think is one that you should not, um, what's the word? Like you shouldn't try to skip over if you definitely need it. And then the other one, number five, um, I would say is a lot of people do not legally protect or their website or limit the liability that they expose themselves to by having a website. And by that, I mean not having disclaimers and terms and conditions and um, having a privacy policy, which is actually required by law. Um, and whenever you're offering someone, you know, some kind of service, you always want to have a disclaimer to, to say like, look, you know, I'm, you're hiring me and I'm a coach, but I can't guarantee that you're going to make X amount of money. I just need you to know that, you know, but a lot of people don't have that on there. And I know it seems like it's boilerplate doesn't matter, but there are people whose job it is to go around suing people so that they can build a body of case law. And so there are people like, so when we get to privacy policy issues, you're required by privacy, U.S. federal privacy laws to have um, a privacy policy on your website. And that privacy policy has to state certain things. So the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, is charged with making sure that people are not basically scamming consumers. They need to make sure that you're um, disclosing information to um, consumers in order for them to conduct business or to interact with you if you are a business person. And so they have said that you need to have certain information on your website, and the privacy policy is one of those things. And then each state can make their own laws. And because when you put up a website, you're basically availing yourself to all the states by, you know, having people in all those different states visit you, you're subjecting yourself to all of those states' laws. Now, California, for example, has said that you need to have a certain thing in your privacy policy or else they it's a $2,500 fine. There are people who could literally go to your website and say so-and-so doesn't have a privacy policy or their privacy policy doesn't state this. I visited their website. I should be paid $2,500 and they can slap you with that fine and you would pay it. Yeah. That's the thing that people don't understand. Like there are people, so people kind of, their organizations, when they either like a law or don't like a law, they kind of search for these, these sitting ducks to make an example of. And I don't say that to scare anyone at all, because the chances of it being you out there who's listening to me are slim, but It happens. That's how a lot of law is developed. So these laws are not made just for fun. The other thing that I think is going to happen is I think it's taking the SEC a while to catch on to the online world. They're they're aware of it. Right now, they focus really heavily on people who provide fitness and health services because those people are very vulnerable. And so, you know, like with all the diet pills and the the juicing and the health (laughs) claims and all that stuff, you know, they're very sensitive. The weight loss claims and um, promises, they're very sensitive to that stuff. But I think once the SEC gets a hold of the fact or, or how much money is being made in the online marketing, online course world, they are going to start cracking down very heavily. Where and are people taking advantage of it? Like, you know, just from your, like, from your, in your opinion, like, where are those practitioners or those coaches, et cetera? How are they taking advantage oh. of the FCC not necessarily being on their tails as of yet? Oh, like in their in their claims when um, whenever somebody is selling an online course and they say um, you're going to make or, or when you watch their webinar or when you even sign up for their webinar. And I think recently Facebook cracked down on this, like they're they're not doing web like ad clickbait anymore or something like that. But, you know, your your ad for your webinar says learn how to 
write your privacy policy in 10 minutes by watching this webinar. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And it sounds crazy, but that's the kind of stuff that's going around. Learn how to, you can be in a, an amazing relationship after watching in, in something you can do 30 minutes a day to, to, I don't know, to have 200,000 downloads on your podcast. (laughs) That's just an example, but that stuff is rampant. And I think that once the FCC sees how much money this community is making, and it's not because the FCC is money hungry, but because if if there is a ton of money that is being made, that means people are paying it. And that means that consumers are being misled. I'm not saying everybody is doing it. They just get concerned because they're like, dang, why are people just forking over this money like this? What is going on? Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> why is this online course creator making a million dollars? Let's look into this, you know? So, um, I think they're going to start cracking down. And I think the people who don't take that seriously, um, it's actually already happening over privacy policies. People are being sued. There, there are a few cases where um, um, websites that didn't have privacy policies um, displayed properly in the right place um, were sued and issued um, an, a, a ridiculous fine. So I think the people who don't take it seriously and stop saying like, eh, whatever. I'm not paying money for something that's never going to happen. I think those are people who are going to get left behind. It's a Mm -hmm. simple fix that you can make now that could just, you know, set you on the road to not have to worry about this down the line. Okay. Tanisha Greer, uh, what are the best sources for online privacy policy in terms of use service notice generators on the internet that won't get a website and entrepreneur that won't get an entrepreneur in trouble? So I've actually gone to a lot of those generators and I've put in information and have created a privacy policy. And I didn't find that they were sufficient because, first of all, a lot of those, I think a lot of those sites are outdated. So they don't update the current law, like the current the current privacy law, like the California the California law I was telling about that's like a $25 fine if you don't have a certain thing in your privacy policy. I think that came about in 2014. And a lot of those generators were around before then. So they don't account for that. Um, also, too, they're very general and they include so much stuff that you don't actually do. Now, let me explain what the privacy policy is. It's basically saying I am collecting this person's personal identifiable information, name, phone number, address, email address. um, And this is what I'm going to do with it. So you have to tell people, hi, thank you for coming to my website. I just want to let you know I'm collecting your information. This is what I'm going to do with your information. Now, everything you say in there that you're going to do, you have to do it. Everything you say you, you collect, that has to be all you collect. You can't leave anything out. And you don't want to put in extra stuff that does not apply to your business because you don't want to be held to or be responsible for doing something you don't have to do. So these privacy policies just basically throws everything in because they want to make sure that you're covered. And a lot of people think that that's good because at least everything's covered. That's not good because the more stuff that you put in there, if you put in there that you don't collect cookies, but you collect cookies, you're violating your privacy policy. Or if you, the other thing that a lot of people don't, don't know is like you put in there, I will never sell your information. Well, guess what? What if you want to sell your company? That now means that you can't ever sell your email list. Uh Oh, because- girl, I got to update my privacy policy. <laughs> <laughs> right. You have put in your privacy policy that you will not sell their information to a third party. All every single generator that I use, I actually went through, you know, I, I, I did the Google. So anyway, to answer her question is, or to answer her question, um, what I did is I drafted a privacy policy based on all of the privacy laws that would apply to a website, um, business, online, entrepreneur, or creative. I drafted one and I created a template because I had clients actually when they were starting, like when I was working at my law firm, I had clients who would approach me about drafting one. And I was like, oh, okay, let me go look. And I would look it up, look up the laws and I drafted one. And so I was like, okay, I can offer this as a template. So I have a template of a privacy policy 
as well as the terms of conditions, as well as a disclaimer and some other contract templates on my website. Now, the reason why the terms and conditions is important is because it limits your liability and it protects your digital content. So it limits your liability in the sense that you're saying to the person, look, you're using this website at your own risk. I mean, basically, that's what you're saying. You're like, I'm not promising you nothing. I'm not telling you to come here for nothing. I'm just putting information out there. You understand, like for me, you understand I am not your lawyer. Do not act on anything I am giving you or information I'm giving you and disregard the advice of your own attorney or your own doctor, or your own life coach, or whatever it is. So you're telling the person, look, I'm letting you know that I'm not telling you to disregard other information from other professionals in your life because I'm not that person to you unless you hire me. Okay. Just by, and that's just by reading my website. Okay. And then the other thing is you're telling people you can't steal and use my content. I'm just letting you know that by coming to this website and using this website, you are promising, you are entering into a legal contract to say that you will not take my my copyrighted content, um, my blog posts, or any of my photos, any of my audio, and use it for commercial purposes. And you list all the reasons why or how they can or can't use it. So the terms of condition is basically a contract that you're signing with the people who are looking at or visiting your website. Another reason it's really important to limit your liability. So remember how I said that because your your website kind of goes out all into the world and the U.S. and the entire world, you basically start subjecting yourself to all these country's laws. That's how laws work. Um, you're availing yourself to their their clients or to their, their residents. And so they want to protect their residents. And so they make up these laws and you have to follow them. Well, you can narrow the law that you're subjected to in your terms and conditions by stating that any disputes regarding any usage of your website or anything um, stated in the website will be governed by a certain law and you can pick the law. You just are freely to pick whatever law and you should pick the state that you live in <laughs> because that's going to be more convenient for you. But a lot of those generated ones, sometimes I've seen a lot that just say New York. And I'm like, why does it say New York? Like, this, And then like you get an email from the person and they're living in like Nebraska, but they have some terms and conditions that was generated by some system and they're going to go to New York to go litigate or arbitrate some clause or some issue. So that's why those documents are really important. Okay. So last question that we have is from Shalene Aaron. And her question is, what is the difference between a patent, copyright, and trademark? I do intellectual property law, but I am not a patent attorney. Patent attorneys are very specialized. They come from an engineering background and there's actually a special bar um, that patent attorneys have to pass in order to practice bef- for the patent, I guess, regulation. It's still the U.S. PTO, which is the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, mm-hmm. but there's a special division for pat- for patents. So my knowledge on patents is limited, um, but I will say that a patent is more of like um, is a design or how um, a mechanism for doing something. So like a chip would be patented or um, your method of doing something would be patented. Um, a trademark is a name, a lo- you, you can trademark a name, a logo, um, a slogan, a word. Um, it's basically like um, the the source of where you get that income, right? So if you get it from like the the name, your brand, right? So that's what the trademark protects. The copyright is um, it's basically what you create. It the, the legal definition is that you create. Um, it protects the expression of an idea. Mm-hmm. So anything that you fixed that you fix to a medium. So the minute you write it down, like if you write on your notepad, that's copyrighted material. Uh, You own the copyright to it. Um, Blog posts, audio files, art, artwork, um, no, well not logo design. So like if you design a t-shirt or something that would be copyrighted. Um, 
So that's the difference between the three. Now, the patent and trademark um, are are registered at the U.S. PTO, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, mm-hmm. and copyrights are are registered with the U.S. Copyright Office. So do you have to register something like every time you, like, let's say for this podcast, right? When I put it up, should I register it with the copyright office? Is that how it works? Well, you could. Um, so in order to register something with the copyright office, you just go to uscopyright.gov, I believe, or U.S. Copyright Office, probably uscopyright.gov. Um, and you have two options. You can register something as a single work which is a $35 fee, or you can register something as a, um, what's the word escaping me right now? A group, a collection, a collection. So that would be something that you can think of. You you can, you could decide how it would be considered a collection. Um, maybe someone who does seasons of their podcast could, could copyright the season, you know, copyright all five or 10 or 12, episodes as season one of the dreams and drive podcast. Um, but yeah, you absolutely could copyright every single episode. Um, you probably wouldn't want to do that. Uh, photographers have the same issue, right? You can't copyright every single photograph or every single photograph that you put out there, right? Because back in the day, in order to develop a, a photograph, it took a lot of work. But, you know, the thing that I say about to, to creatives, like the web designers and the photographers, I would say to work in your copyright intention in your workflow, like decide, come up with a mechanism like or, or a system or a method. How, what am I going to copyright? What am I not going to copyright? What am I okay with if I don't copyright this work? Whenever you're creating any work for a client, you're not going to copyright it because you're selling your copyright to that person for the most part. Right. So if I hire someone to design a logo for me, they own the copyright to it because they designed it. It doesn't matter that I paid them because I contracted them to do it. But once they give it to me, they should also sell me the copyright, the full copyright. Now, that's why it's really important to look at the contracts you enter into with people who you work with, because I know someone who, as a photographer, has in their contract that they retain the full copyright to all of the photographs that they take. Even if you hire me to take, well, if you hire them to take it, they own it. So make sure you look at what the copyrights rights are mm-hmm. in your contract. And as someone who is paying a, a designer to, um, pr- to produce a copyrighted piece of work for them, you want to make sure that the copyright says, that they are selling it to you, not licensing it. Because licensing just means they're allowing you to use it for however long they put in there. But you want to make sure that they are selling it completely to you. And if anything, they are the ones who are retaining a license. And as a photographer, you want to decide what you want to give away. Do you want to completely sell your pictures? Do you want to um, give your clients a... um, um, a non-exclusive perpetual license to use it as they please? Or do you want to give them an exclusive one or, or sell it and retain one for yourself? So it depends on you. Um, you might get a most, I mean, I, I was shocked when this person showed, um, showed me their contract that said that they retain all the copyright because I think most people don't read it. So you're probably not going to get pushback. It's challenging for a lot of business owners because so many people are just new business owners. We're, we're really out here just just going along. We have a passion and we're putting our dreams in drive and yeah. we're just we're just not we we don't know what to look for, how to look. And I talk about legal because that's that's my expertise. But I had the same challenges with marketing and social media. Mm -hmm. I I don't come from a marketing background, so I have no idea what is out there for me, what I can screw up, what um, I can really do to help me with my business when it comes to marketing or social media or technology. So it's not this just happens to be something that I'm specialized in. But I think because I work in a field that people 
um, ignore so much, I know that before I make a move, I better call a specialist. Um, because what specialist do you have on speed dial? <laughs> I can't say. I can't say. Or like, what so, type of no. people do you think? Like, what I kind of had, experts do you think you need to have as a small business creative person? I look at my time in a, I think, in a very different way than most entrepreneurs look at their time. I look at my time as I am the only person who can write this memo about Section three fifty nine of the IRS code. Me, only me. Nobody else on my team can do that. So, and that memo has to get done. So I can't be designing a website. I can't be doing social media. I can't be doing my financials. I just can't afford to spend time on those things. So I hire experts. That's, but that's the background that I come from because I just see my time so differently. When, I mean, I build like, depending on what it is, depending on my level of specialty, I build two fifteen to $300 an hour. So I always ask myself, how much money could I be making instead of doing this thing that I'm doing? And how much would it cost me to, to hire somebody to do it? Right. And it was funny because like when we, when I first started at the law firm, we all got secretaries, right? You're like straight out of law school. You're a lawyer. What? You're like, everybody gets, everybody gets a secretary. And so we're all like, um, so how do we use our secretary? Like, what do we ask them to do? Like, can we ask them to go get lunch? Basically, that's kind of what we're asking. Right. But anyway, so the partner says to us, he was like, you bill in six minute increments. That means that instead of, so like when you call me, you're my client. When you call me and I talk to you for 15, for seven minutes, I don't bill you for 15 minutes. I bill you for six minutes, right? That's, that's, that's how it works. If I bill you in higher increments, you're just, I'm charging you more because most people will call and just have a five minute phone call. So we build in six minute increments. So he said, I'll put it this way. If it takes you longer than six minutes to do it, have your secretary do it because you could be billing somebody. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and that was the rule. If it took you more than six minutes, have your secretary do it. And I have, I have taken that mentality into my business because I know it's really difficult to think and to say, damn, I'm going to have to pay that person. But I always think if I spend 10 hours trying to figure out how to update WordPress, that's $2,500 I could be making. I think a lot of people don't think about it that way because they just think about the money leaving their hands. But once you value yourself and once you think about the value you bring to your business and how important you are as the creative in your business, I think you will start to give away more tasks because you can always replace that income that you're paying to the person with way more money because you're so valuable to your company. So I have a web designer. Mm -hmm. I have someone to help me organize my brain when it comes to my content. Um, I just hired someone to help me with social media. So there's one more thing that I definitely want to ask you just because I think it's something that we don't talk about a lot. So I was on your website earlier and I was reading one of your like older blog posts about the importance of estate planning. Mm. Why do entrepreneurs especially need to think about estate planning? And you talked about how, you know, this is something that often is the reason for like the wealth difference between between like blacks and whites in America, right? Like why as an mm -hmm. entrepreneur do you really need to focus on this part of like, you know, law that you may not, not you may not necessarily think is important. So, this is what I would this is why I think it's important because maybe explain what is estate planning first. Okay, okay. Tell so, well, estate planning is just um Coming up with a plan to dispose of your assets in your death. And if you do that properly, you can pass wealth down from generation to generation. And I don't know if the article you're referencing is the one that came out, I think, around February or end of January of this year, that basically said that the only reason why whites are richer than blacks and Latinos yeah, and this was the one. Asians, this was the, one. the only reason is because whites pass down wealth from generation to generation. And um, they did a study um, of a group of people 
So they they studied people who made the same six figure salary, black and white. But still, with that six figure salary, the blacks had way more. I mean, the whites had way more access to capital because what was black people doing? They were paying. They were using that six figure salary to buy to pay for the mortgage that or for the house that they bought. They were using that six figure salary to pay for student loans. White people don't have to do that because their parents have paid for their loans. They don't have to. Um, get into these really high um, interest mortgages because their parents have helped them with a down payment, a significant down payment for for their homes, right? So they did a study on the six figure salary. They did a study on two people in two parent homes. Whites still had more access to capital, right? They did another study on um, savings. Blacks and whites save at the same rate from the same income. Whites still have more access to capital. So it, so it, it was something that validated what I've been knowing since I started doing estate planning is that black people, we're, we're out here killing ourselves, Raina. Like I'm doing it too. Like I'm working 15 hour days. We are grinding. That's like the new thing. And the thing I ask people is like, what would happen if you die today? All of the value in your company is in you. Mm-hmm. So if you die today, What legacy are you leaving for your child? And like I say, an eight-year-old can't run your company. I have a two-year-old son. He can't run my law firm. He can't run. And I know that sounds like ludicrous, but if I don't put anything in place, that's the position. That's all I'm leaving him is your mom used to have a company. And so what I tell entrepreneurs is because all of your value is in you, then you need to insure yourself. Every single person who starts a business or forms an LLC puts up a website, they should go and get a secu- they should go and get an insurance policy for a million dollars. How does that work? Oh, to get an insurance policy for a million dollars? I don't know. I don't think so. It should be like what? <laughs> do you have one? <laughs> um, yes, I do. Okay. I do. Well, because well, I got one when I worked at the at the law firm because I was like I know that I am I'm making a lot of income, mm-hmm. right? And if I were to die, I wasn't paying anybody like any bills in my family, but my family, I didn't have kids at the time, but my family would lose out on income that I could have either helped them do, or I bought a house. I didn't want to leave my family with a house that they now had to sell because they couldn't afford the mortgage on it. You know, so I took out insurance policies to be able to allow my family to have something while I was gone. And so a million dollars may have been an exaggeration, but you should, first of all, if you're working at any job and you feel like you want to be an entrepreneur, make sure you take out an insurance policy now. And then once you do start your business, you should also get business insurance, which is different from just regular personal insurance. Mm -hmm. Now I don't sell insurance. I don't know the ins and outs of it, but contact an insurance advisor, contact, um, you know, anyone who, I don't know, you can just literally probably cold call MetLife or something. Um, and they would be able to, to show you the right place. If you checked within your network, I bet you there's somebody who provides insurance. So that's the first thing. And that's how you would do it. That's how you would pass your company down to your child. Because this LLC that you have, this email list, um, the products that you're selling, the e-course, those things need someone to run them in order for it to be profitable. Just having an email list, I mean, unless you collect diamonds, <laughs> and you have diamonds. <laughs> and they can just get the stash out there. The- <laughs> yeah, I mean, they can sell the diamond and gold bars. But a lot of what we have is intellectual property, right? The, it's our, our wealth is in our mind. And we are working right now on getting that wealth out of our minds and materializing it. And so until that is materialized and we have actual cash in the bank, and even when you do have cash in the bank, you need something to pass down. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have young children, what you don't want to happen is for you to go out and get a life insurance policy and then put your young child, maybe you're a single parent or 
Um, even if you're not a single parent, you put your young minor child on that life insurance policy as a beneficiary, what's going to happen is, first of all, the the life insurance company is not going to pay money directly to an eight-year-old. I always like to use <laughs> the eight-year-old. Um, they're not going to pay money to that child because children can't inherit legal title to money. They can only get equitable title. So equitable title means it's for them. They're entitled to it. Legal title is the person who can control it and move it around. So the life insurance policy is not going to pay it to them because they can't control it or manage it. So somebody's going to have to go to court. Guess what? You're going to have to hire a lawyer. Somebody's going to have to go to court. Somebody's going to have to become a conservator or a guardian of the child's money. Then the life insurance policy will pay it to them. And then this person's going to have to go to court every year to tell the court what they're doing with this money. Right. Then the worst part is that when the kid turns 18, they get everything. So if you have a million dollar policy, your 18 year old is getting a million dollars or 200,000 or even 50. You know, so I think um, people just this is something that's so foreign to a lot of entrepreneurs because we're just not used to being in business and we don't understand how much time and value is in us as mm. the business owner. Now, the one thing I would say that every single person should have, every single person listening to this podcast should have is a power of attorney, even you, Raina. So a power of attorney is a document that basically allows someone else to act on your behalf. And what I say to people is a lot of people are really awesome. They go out, they get an LLC, and they have a business bank account. But you're the only person who's listed on your business bank account. If you got into an, a car accident, if you were incapacitated in some kind of way, how would anybody get access to your money? If you run your own business, you're the one who's in charge of everything. How would anybody get access to it? How would they get access to your email, your Facebook page, your social media accounts? So a power of attorney is a document that you can have while you're alive. It's basically planning for your incapacity. You can have it while you're alive. It can be in effect while you're capacitated. So it could, you know, you could have traveled to just to Jamaica and you could you could have told your sister, hey, I need you to sign a contract for me because this sponsor is telling me I have to sign it today because their budget's closing. So can you sign this contract on my behalf? If your sister has a power of attorney, she can do that for you. It doesn't have to be that you're dead. It just has to be or incapacitated that you're not you're not available. But she has permission to do that on your behalf at any time. So, How do you go about, like, is it just, can it just be a document that you have or is it something you have to file somewhere? Well, okay, so for your bank account, um, banks are very um, particular about um, their power of attorney. So I would tell everyone to get this document, I would tell them to contact their bank, call your 1-800 number and just say, or go into your branch. Do you have a specific document for a power of attorney for this bank account. If they have that, fill that out and get a copy of it and have it on file with the bank. Now, obviously, because this person has so much power um, to do to act on your behalf, you want it to be someone who you can trust. This is not going to be someone who <laughs> obviously you just met, right? So um, you want to tell this person that you have given them the power of attorney. Do <laughs> you imagine if you're like, hey, mom, you know you're my power of attorney. <laughs> right. Or your mom just doesn't know, right? Everybody's like, who's Raina's power of attorney? And it's like, nobody knows. Um, this document is just on file with the bank. Nobody even knows what bank. Um, so tell the person who you're choosing but also give them a um, a copy of the document so that they can have it and show it to people. Now, if it's for anything else other than the power of a, um, for your bank account, then some states have what's called a statutory power of attorney, where the legislatures have written one out for you. And you can basically just check which powers you want the person to have. So different powers would be like if they have the ability to sign contracts on your behalf, if they have the ability to sell your real estate, if they have the ability to speak to tax authorities on your behalf. They have basically like a little box you can check to see which ones the person had, which ones you want to give them. All states don't offer that. So I would tell people to go to their banks for their bank accounts, for the ones for the bank accounts. If the bank account says, we don't care, just bring anything in, 
and then go to your state and you can use Google. You can just put Google power of attorney or Google statutory power of attorney and then put in your state and it will let you know if you have one. Now you will know that it's from your state, your actual state, because it'll end in like a dot gov or dot us or whatever this a dot state, whatever. So you want to make sure it's from your actual state website because there are tons of programs around that are offering power of attorneys. Um, for X state, but it's not written by that state. Now, the next thing you could do is go to a lawyer. Now, for a power of attorney, I mean, I usually don't charge more than $200 or $300 for, to draft a power of attorney. Mm-hmm. So um, that's something that's pretty cheap that a lawyer can, well, I shouldn't say cheap, inexpensive, that a lawyer can do for you. So I know it's like, man, I have all this stuff to do as a business person, but it's like you're in business, you know, I mean, the cost of doing you're... business. That's something I feel like we as creative sometimes we don't we like the idea of what it means to be an entrepreneur, but we don't necessarily always think it through. Like, do you really want yeah. to be an entrepreneur? <laughs> And the cost. I mean, I I don't want <laughs> I don't want to pay somebody for a website every two weeks. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't want that cost. Um, but I don't I don't have a choice. If I want to do this business, I always need to have someone I can refer to who can update my website in an hour as opposed to me spending five or six hours. Mm -hmm. So it's just a cost you have to accept. That's, that's just, but you can't look at it as only a cost. You have to look at it as I'm able to reach, like even with this podcast, with my own podcast, with my website, I'm able to reach thousands of people, something I couldn't do when I was sitting in my office at my law firm, getting referrals, basically like from my network who were just people in Virginia, DC and Maryland. Now I have people in Georgia, Kentucky and New Jersey and New York and California who I'm reaching and helping. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a trade off. But, you know, you just got to you got to take some money to make money. (laughs) Thank you for all of your wonderful legal advice. I feel like there's just so much stuff that I learned. I have a list of everything I got to do. It's quite long, (laughs) but we'll discuss it at another time. (laughs) But one thing I want to ask. They're going to be like, don't bring the lawyer on anymore. Don't bring her on. (laughs) One of the one things I want to ask you is like just with like, you know, reflecting upon everything upon your own journey. What do you think is just a challenge that you're currently working? through and like you know what's motivating you to keep going through it not going Mm -hmm. through it but like uh getting to keep going yeah so a challenge for me is um reaching people i i i know i have a a, um great information to give people i know i really want to help but i think one of my biggest challenges is getting people to understand how important this is and to see the value that I see in it, that's a big challenge because, like I said, like with Facebook and Google and every person out there who now has a law degree from Google University, it's like, why do we need you? Like, we we know what we're doing. We're fine. So that's been a real challenge. What keeps me going is when um, I receive text messages, not text, like DMs or emails from people who I have no idea are even listening to Mm -hmm. my little podcast. And they're like, thank you so much. Like I received an email and and there was someone who said, or a DM, someone said, thank you so much for that episode. I went to my website and I took down all the pictures that I had because I thought all I had to do was just give permission. I know that's so uninspirational, but it was like this person actually protected themselves because of of information that I gave them, you know? So that's the stuff that keeps me going and wanting to reach more and more people because I want for us to be out here and like informed Mm -hmm. legal wise and not stick our head in the sand about stuff, legal stuff and and be like, that's for other people. No, it's for all of us. And and that's what I want to share with people. And what are your favorite resources or tools that you personally cannot live without and have really helped you in your own entrepreneurial endeavors? The most amazing thing that I have done is I am using drip email marketing. A lot of people haven't even heard of it. I don't think so. It's created by the people who created, who created lead pages. Mm -hmm. 
And the reason, and I'm going to write an article about this because I love drip so much. Now, here's the thing about drip. It's, it's like $49 a month, which is so much more expensive than I think every other email system. But here's the thing. When I was using MailChimp, which was free, I don't even think I went into it. I set up the R or the RSS feed for how people could get my latest blog posts and podcasts. And I never used it. I never emailed the people on my list. I never interacted with them. And so with drip, it's so easy to use and, and creating funnels and flows and email flows. So now when someone subscribes to my podcast, I know how to set up an email that says, Hey, thank you for subscribing to the podcast. Like I wasn't able to do that before. So <laughs> I, I, I absolutely love drip. I just, it's like the best thing ever. And what's something that has surprised you or makes you excited about entering the media sphere? Um, What has surprised me about, I am surprised at how open I've been Mm. um, about my own story, about my background, about my jobs and how I got to where I am. I'm really, really surprised at how open I've been. Because it's always it's something that I've always kept close to my chest. And I think um, as lawyers, we just because we have so many ethical obligations, we just kind of don't talk about it Um, because you just never know when you're tripping over some ethical law. Once I got over that and just did what I tell all my clients to do is just research it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Once I researched it, I'm like, oh, I can do this. So yeah, that's the thing I've been most surprised about. And what am I, what I'm excited about is to share more of myself and, and, um, more of my story and my journey to, to let people know that I'm just like everybody else. Like I am struggling with so many things in my business. Like a lot of other people are, And this legal stuff just happens to be what I specialize in. But everybody has their own gift. And my my calling, I think, is to just make sure that entrepreneurs don't get tripped up or that they can grow their business the same way corporations grow their business by using a lawyer. I think that was just a perfect way to segue into our lightning round. Are you ready? Oh, God. (laughs) So this part of the interview, I'm going to give you a prompt and I want you to tell me the first word that comes to mind. All right. So the first word is park. Um, Learning, because I think sometimes you have to be still to to take information in. You can't always be going reverse managing your ego, (laughs) (laughs) because sometimes you have to take a step back and you have to remember, like, who you are and. And like, check yourself. Neutral. Moving forward. Drive. Going ham. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's the first time I heard that one. I like that one. I like that one. And you know, if you want to be a dream driver, you have to have your keys to success. So Art, tell me three things that you think every dream driver needs in their toolkit before they hit the road. Gosh, I would say patience. Mm -hmm. Because um, you're just going to have some tough days. You're going to have tough weeks in a row and you just have to be patient and know that your day is going to come. It's going to come and try not to look at people where they are in their journey because you don't know what they've been through. You don't know who they know. You don't know how they got there, what they had access to. So just be patient with what you're doing and know that you keep working hard. It's going to come. So number two, resilience. Mm -hmm. Again, you're going to take some hits, but you can't take it personally. Like it's the same as like developing thick skin. You, you just have to, you have to go into this. No, like being like, I have a bulletproof vest on. And even if I start getting shots, I'm just going to keep walking because you're going to get knocked down so quickly, so many times that the only way you're going to be able to be productive is to just brush it off and keep going. And then the third one I would say is faith. And I'm not talking about like, I'm talking about like faith in yourself. I'm not talking about faith in um, Jesus Christ, which obviously you, you, I think you have to have, but I'm talking about faith, unfounded, um, unreasonable, faith in yourself. 
because you have no proof from your own self that what you're doing is going to work. The Mm -hmm. only reason you wake up every single day is because you have faith that what you are doing is going to work. And you have to have that un that irrational, no holds barred, unrealistic, undying, unselfish, or it's actually selfish faith that what you are doing is going to work. And you have nothing to base that on. You can't look at somebody else's journey because that's happening to them. You can't base anything about what's going to happen in your journey Mm -hmm. on someone else. You can only base it on yourself. So you have to have that faith that no matter what you're coming to the table with, no matter what you're up against, um, you know that you are going to be able to carry yourself through. So that would be the, the three things that I think you have to have before you hit the road. Those are all such great things. We have patience, resilience, and faith. So our, tell our dream drivers where they can find you online, if they want to check out your podcast, if they want to check out the, the um, templates and stuff that you were talking about earlier. Tell us where we can find you online. Okay, so on Instagram, I'm artsteel underscore ESQ. Same on Twitter. I have a um, Facebook group, which is Legal Leads for Entrepreneurs um, Community. And then if they want to get the podcast, I'm on I or Apple Podcasts, Stitcher and SoundCloud, Legal Leads for Entrepreneurs Podcast. And then if they want to get show notes for my podcast, they can go to artsteel.co slash podcast for the templates. Um, I am giving them a special website to go to, which is artsteel.co slash dreams and drive. And they can find information for all of the templates that um, they want to get that I offer. I will be adding more to them because every day somebody comes up with some new contract that they need (laughs) and I have to, (laughs) I have to draft it. Um, So, but yeah, so they can go there. You know what? I will also make sure to link to everything that Art just mentioned in our show notes as well for this episode. So you can just go to dreamsanddrive.com. You can get those as well. Well, thank you, Art, so much. This has been so, um, I have learned, like my notes page is crazy right now. Like I have learned so much here. And I think that this is something that we as entrepreneurs, we as creatives, we need to think more about the legal aspects of our business. And I'm about to go think about who's going to be my power of eternity. Yes, yes. (laughs) That's that's your assignment for tonight. Yeah, everybody like, should be thinking who do about I trust? that. Hmm. <laughs> well, and and make it make sure it's somebody close, like distance wise, close to you, mm-hmm. right? Um, because if you're if you need if they need access to something, you know, you don't want it to be somebody that's across the country. <laughs> that is very very true. So that's that's another thing to think about. All right, thank you so much, Art. This has been wonderful. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. All right, so that's a wrap for episode 105 with Art. I hope that you enjoyed hearing her dream driving story as well as her keys to success. Now, as Art mentioned, if you want to access any of her templates and get some discounts for that, just go to artsteel.co slash dreams and drive. That's A R T S T E E L E dot C O slash dreams and drive. If you love this episode, if you really, really loved it, I would encourage you once again to screenshot this and share it with a friend. The best way to share it with a friend, in my opinion, would be to share it on Instagram stories. I feel like everyone's on Instagram. Everyone's always flipping through stories all day. And I love when you guys um, have just been sharing it that way. So continue to do so. We are dreams and drive across the board. So make sure to tag us. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And you can also use the hashtag dreams and drive as well. Don't forget to enter our episode 104 giveaway. Now we are going Going to be running that for the entire week so it's going to end on september 17th so if you want to win a copy of jensen cheryl's book you are a badass at making money just go to dreamsanddrive.com slash win and if you want to join our facebook community because it's growing by the day and it's such a great place to hear you know to get feedback from you guys and to also interact with other dream drivers just go to dreamsanddrive.com slash facebook and you can also just search dream driver mastermind 
on Facebook to request access as well. As we are speaking on one of the things that I've been trying to work on is just getting the schedule for the show worked out. Who should go next? What episode should go next? I'm about to pull it up right now. That's why I'm talking still. Our episode 106 guests are going to be Jet Setting Jasmine and King Noir. Oh, it's going to be a fun episode. Hope you guys enjoy that one. As always, keep dreaming, keep driving, and we'll chat again in episode 106.